hope you said something nice about me. Yeah, no. uh, so, I live in New York, and after 20 years, I'm still in love with this place. I mean, the diversity is incredible. The fact you can find any food you want 24-7. Even the unwanted free entertainment on your morning commute. Some of you have been there, you know. There's one thing I hate, though, and that's cocktail parties. And it's not that I don't like cocktails or parties. It's just that in New York in particular, the first thing anyone asks you is, what do you do? I don't know why, it drives me crazy, but it's what they do. So I say, I'm a designer. And when you say you're a designer in New York, you're invariably treated to a response like this. And I understand it, like, I, I get it. it. The truth is, I think most people's immediate response to design is they think it's only about the surface of things. That design is only about style. And, quite frankly, style is superficial. And I have to say that there was a time that I felt this way too. Like, very early in my career, I became very dissatisfied with only making things prettier. So much so that I questioned what I did. And sort of the moment this all changed for me was when I decided to really take back, step back and take a very fundamental question into mind. And that is, what is the role of design? Now, it seems like a question I should have answered long before becoming a designer. Uh, and it is something that I struggle with for, for quite some time. And what I came to realize is that there really is no one answer to this question. And the only answer that should have any meaning to me is the way I personally chose to answer that. And really the design that spoke most to me was design that not only solved problems, but raised questions. Questions about what is the role of objects in our lives? Questions about the power of design to raise awareness on global issues. And power of, power of design as a tool to bridge the gap between technology and human nature. And so I made it the focus of my practice to try and answer some of these questions through the output of my work. And I'd like to share a few of these with you now. Now, look, I think it's pretty obvious climate change is something we're all very passionate about. But is it something that we think about each and every day? And what if we did? Would we be more compelled to action? So I created this. It's a mirror. But it has a surprise. When everyone walks in front of the mirror, you're seen neck deep in water. It was created as a daily reminder to remind us where we're all headed if we don't take action each and every day. Now, when I was a child, my grandmother kept a box of letters between she and my grandfather throughout the war. And it was very easy to, to build a relationship, to reconstruct their personal relationship through this correspondence. But, you know, technology has all but eviscerated these physical artifacts of a relationship. We no longer write letters. We write SMS messages. And with the click of a button, you can delete the entire course of that relationship as it was digitally documented. So I thought, can design do something with this? So I created Black Box. It's a very simple tool. Cash register receipt and just a tiny bit of software. And through it, you can actually print out the entire course of a relationship, no matter how long. And since it's a cash register receipt, of course, you each get a copy. Now, <clears throat> I was asked by Times Square to design a public seating installation. And, you know, Times Square is one of the busiest intersections in the world. And what I thought was missing was not just a place for people to sit and meet and congregate, but something that they could actually visually locate over the heads of thousands and thousands of tourists and become a beacon as a point of meeting. 
So I created The Village. It's a series of installations I, that, in its first instance, it's quite vertical. And I did this so that you could actually locate it from quite a distance away in the space. Now I chose the forms of a house to tell you, at a glance, that this is a place for you to sit and relax and take a break from the bustle that is New York. And thirdly, I chose the iconic yellow of the New York City taxi cab because it's very functional. It actually breaks through the visual clutter of one of the busiest visual intersections uh, on the planet. Mm, here's another one. Um, now, look, there's nothing more iconic than a pair of five pocket jeans. Um, but I don't think most people realize they're actually a piece of technology designed for 19th century workmen. Now, I partnered with the fashion brand 3x1 with an idea on updating this technology. So I really started off with what behavioral differences do we have between us and a 19th century workman? Well, first and foremost, did you know this fifth pocket was designed to carry a pocket watch? Well, not many of us carry those anymore, but what we do carry are cards. So I simply expanded the pocket to fit a card, but lined it with a Faraday cloth, which is an RFID blocking material, so that thieves can't digitally steal your information without ever touching your body. Now, another behavior we have is that we carry devices in our pockets. So we simply expanded them a bit, but lined them with a microfiber cloth, like you'd use to clean eyeglasses, so that each and every time you pull out or remove your phone, the screen is clean for you. Another behavior we engage in that the 19th century workmen never did is we travel at night by electric light. So we work with 3M and applied a strip of reflective material to the inside of the back that if you are traveling at night, you have the ability to flip up your pants and have an add a bit of safety. But I think the biggest innovation we did is we did all of this without ever changing the look of the jeans that everyone knows and love. In fact, the only way you'd know someone is wearing a pair of our jeans is a subtle white ribbon on the fifth pocket. So I'm a designer. So naturally, I'm a bit of a Japanophile. But particularly, I love sake. And for those of you who don't know, sake is every bit as complex as wine. Yet most people, most Westerners, think it comes in either hot or cold. That's the equivalent of all you know about wine is it comes in red or white. I mean, that seemed rather sad to me. Um, so when a client of mine suggested we launch a sake into the West to be the first recognizable product, uh, that was all in. So the result of that collaboration is Soto. First of all, we wanted a name that had meaning. Soto means outside in Japanese, which is where we're bringing it. And we wanted it to be memorable and pronounceable. But secondly, we wanted the bottle to break category norms and become something instantly iconic. So it's completely opaquely printed, except for a hole through the middle that represents the Japanese flag. Uh, and it's been actually quite successful. It's the uh, only sake sold in every Ace Hotel, Edition Hotel, and Soho House around the world, and many other venues who've never carried a sake before. So I was rather proud of that. I know I've seen like I'm bouncing all over the place, but that's kind of my work. Um, so here's one thing. I think when the vast majority of people start to think about designing sustainable products, the first thing you think about is, are the materials used, right? That, you know, bioplastics and bamboo are the answer. And while they are fantastic, I would argue that designing a product that is meant to last from generation to generation is far more sustainable than making one out of reclaimed wood that's going to have to be discarded the first time you move. So when the Smithsonian uh, National Design Museum asked me to develop a, a product that they could sell, uh, I decided to put that, that theory into action. And I created uh, a series of flat pack tables that are made from noble materials, in this case, Carrera marble. And they are assembled by the end user, and they fit together using only gravity. Now, this allows them to be disassembled and deconstructed if they ever change hands or if the owner ever moves. 
Um, and, you know, the sort of the timeless design, and I think the, you know, we, I attempted to make them look as if they should be handed down from generation to generation. But I think the, the simplicity of the design and the nature of the materials really come together to give, uh, you know, a new voice to the dialogue on what sustainability and design should be. Now, I don't know if you follow the news, uh, but there's been a lot of talk about hate lately coming from America, right? And I was particularly struck by the recent ban on transgender people in the U.S. military. Uh, sing sing singling out of people who I consider incredibly brave to serve in a capacity defined by bravery seemed not only vile, but stupid. And so I thought about some form of protest, you know, f fighting fire with fire. But, you know, I, I wondered if there was another way that I could join the conversation. And so, rather turning hate back on the oppressor, I thought maybe it's better to celebrate the beauty of the oppressed. So, with my longtime collaborators, Oda Bastian, we created this. It's, it's actually a series of rugs that are meant to reflect the beauty and power of transformation. Each one is a different view take, a different style. They're all represented individually in this, I think, this very, very strong message of, you know, the beauty of, of, of finally getting to become who you are. And we donated all proceeds of sale to the ACLU. That's an American organization that fights for the rights of the oppressed. But really, the biggest challenge with this uh, project was, you know, my fear of causing offense to the transgender community. You know, a straight white male giving his voice to their cause. Uh, and, and the only way I was able to overcome that was by realizing, you know, the cause of equality should be the cause for us all. And, you know, I was, I was very proud instead of throwing up my hands in, in frustration to try to do something positive uh, with a very dire situation. So, you know, I'm deeply interested, interested in the intersection of technology and culture. I think it's fantastic how connected we all are. But I also find t having just a moment to take a break from the constant pings and notifications that our daily soundtrack is a very difficult thing to do. So, and in order to try to force us to take a break, I created this. Looks relaxing, no? Uh, well, it's actually a very simple technology. It's just noise-canceling headphones and a visor that completely blocks your vision, creating complete temporary isolation. But it looks really aggressive, no? Well, it's designed to be that way. The spikes in the bright red color are meant... Yeah, when you are wearing this, you cannot see or hear anyone. So the bright red color and the spikes are there to tell you, fuck off and leave me alone. I need a break. And I think it does it pretty well. And, and sort of the last example I'm going to share with you is just one where you never know where ideas come from. Like, I was playing poker with uh, some friends of mine, and, you know, we've seen a deck of playing cards a million times. And for some reason, it struck me when I was holding a nine of hearts, why are there nine hearts and the number nine and a heart on the nine of hearts? Was this left over from a time of widespread illiteracy? You know, furthermore, why is there a portrait of a person with a sword going through his head? Does that tell me any more information than I need? And this sort of led me down this path of trying to understand simplicity in communication. Like, how much can you reduce while still maintaining a playing deck. And so I did that. I did this exercise on these cards. I tried to remove everything that was absolutely unnecessary to communicate what a playing card deck needs to communicate. And it turns out, even on the back, you don't need very much. A single diagonal line, regardless of how you turn it, if they're held in your hand, will tell you front from back. Um, and sort of the interesting thing about this is uh, that it, it actually became the single best-selling product of AreaWare who put them in production. 
And I guess it just goes to show you never know where following an idea will take you. So that's a sample of the work I've been able to do since I really took a step back and sort of fundamentally address like what is the role of a designer and what does that mean to me? And you know, it's, it's my hope that if you're struggling at all with your own career, like if, if you just take a moment to readdress some fundamentals, ask yourself, what is the role of I do and what do you think it should be? That it may lead you someplace you had never dreamed of. Because quite honestly, questions are more powerful than answers. Like answers are the destination, but it's the questions that create the journey. I thank you. <laughs>